morning. Good to be with you guys. You you did survive the uh, the daylight savings time change. You are clear, and you're in church without an extra hour of sleep. You're clearly God's favorite people in the whole world, and we are so glad that you guys are with us. My name is Jeff, and I'm the senior pastor. It's good to be with you. Uh, welcome, those of you. You might be watching this, uh, listening to this, however you're taking it in, uh, sometime later, maybe in the afternoon or even during the week. We're glad that you guys are with us. Thanks for, for tuning in. So we are in this series called You Are Here. The premise is really, really simple, and it's all about your own spiritual formation and just kind of finding where you are in the journey of life because the, the premise is real simple, and that is you can't get to where you want to go to until you first really know where you are. And so I hope you've got a copy of the book, Journey of the Soul. Bill and Christy kicked it off last week. We're going to dive in. Too thick, too thick of a book to preach the entire book. Can't preach the book. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm basically going to walk through just the high points, the the ideas, the stages. I'm going to relate this back into scripture and I'm going to tie this into my own spiritual journey as well, just so that you can kind of see in sort of in sort of a real time where we are and where hopefully you are. And so maybe I'm going to serve as sort of an, an example in a good way, I hope, and go, oh, that was a good idea. I think I might try something like that. And then I'm also going to share some stories out of my own life that you're going to, I'm going to be the poster child of how not to grow in the Lord, okay? And so those are going to be the moments when you're going to be like, don't know why you did that. That was dumb. I don't think I'm going to do that. Good, good for you. Learn from my mistakes. And so that'll be okay. Hey, but before we do this and before we dive too terribly deep into what we're going to talk about this morning and we talk about God, let's speak with God. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and you would open our hearts so that we would receive your word, the written word and the living word. God, we pray that this Lenten journey will be shaped by your spirit so that we can do your will that we would walk in the way of Christ today, now, and always. And may God, we bring glory to your name. For it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. I came to faith in Christ when I was about 12 years old, I guess, somewhere in that, in that time frame, 11, 12, somewhere in there. I remember it very clearly. A visitation team from uh, an area church had come by the house. You've heard me say this before. I didn't grow up going to church. And so these people, uh, it was on a Tuesday evening. I don't remember when it was in the spring of the year. I remember that. And, uh, and so they showed up and they were, and my parents weren't home. And so, you know, they knocked on the door and they were wearing church clothes and they looked nice. And so I just said, sure, come on in. And so they came in. I know, kids letting in strangers. Good job, Jeff. Way to go. Like your parents clearly didn't teach you well. Yeah. And so they came in and so, and they presented the gospel to me and my brother sitting on our, our living room couch. And so me and my, we came to faith, prayed the prayer and came to faith in Jesus. And it was really good. Here's the problem. The problem was there was no follow-up, none whatsoever, zero. And so I didn't grow up in church and I really didn't get, you know, interested in church at all. And I wasn't really even interested in church. I was interested in the girls that went to church. When my friend, I'm just being honest with y'all, I'm just going to tell you the truth. When my friend, when I was 15 years old, invited me to come to a Wednesday night Bible study that his youth group was a part of. And I had no interest, zero interest in the Bible. But he had a 1965 convertible Camaro and it was really sweet. And he, I didn't drive. And he said, if I come pick you up, would you come? I said, sure, because I'd like to ride in your car. And so he did. And so that's, that was my ride to church. And then I went and it wasn't that boring and it was okay. And it was kind of cool, sort of, you know, I mean, I wasn't so much, in, you know, in sure about the Jesus stuff and God and whatever, but the girls, that was good. Yeah. So I went. And so God will use any motive. Okay. I'm just going to tell you, you know, he'll just use anything to grab your attention. And so he did. And so there's really no follow-up, no investment. I wasn't really growing in my faith in Christ until probably my early college years, if I'm going to be honest with you. And that was when the guy at the church that I was attending, it was my home church, Red Bank United Methodist. This guy's name was David. David took an interest in my life because he obviously saw something in me that needed to be coached, mentored, poured into, discipled, and that's what he began to do. And so along with three or four other guys, David, what basically David did was he just opened his Bible and his life and his calendar and he gave us access. And so by giving us access, what he was able to do was he was able to, to, to demonstrate for us what, 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 a, what an authentic life looked like that followed Christ. And the beautiful thing was he was a few stages further down the road. 
And so because David was further down the road in his, er, his own journey of faith, there were four or five guys that got together with him. And so we got to see what following Jesus looked like at a deeper walk with Christ. Now, if you remember, I don't know how long you've been a Christian. You may not even be a Christian. You may be early in your journey. You may be later in your journey. I don't know. I would say there's a smattering of everybody here. I would just simply say, if you've been a believer for any length of time, think back with me, will you? Just go back in time to those early days of coming to faith. And you will remember that in that period of time in your life, everything was clear. I mean, it was just, it was perfectly clear. The world was very black and white. There was good and there was evil and there was right and there was wrong. And there is good and there is evil and there is right and there is wrong. But, but you were so excited and you were so enthused and you were just excited to, 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 to grow in the faith and open the scripture and, and this kind of thing. And then what you discover over time as you live into your faith is you begin to discover the subtle nuances of Christian faith. You, you suddenly come to the realization that differing people have differing interpretations on what the scriptures mean. And so you, maybe you've not forgotten those kind of times and, and that was it. And so, you know, I, I just, I know that, that sometimes what we do in our spiritual life is we have a way of thinking it's, it's linear. It's this movement, kind of like these candles indicate here. We're moving through the, the weeks of Lent. And so this is the beginning stage. And then there's this one, and there's this one, and there's this one. And so we, we mistakenly think that our journey of faith is linear because we're finite creatures and, and we think beginning and end and, and that we're just never going to escape that. But the reality is your faith development, our faith development is not linear it's more like a spiral staircase. And this is probably the image I think that really sort of sets it apart. This is really sort of, you know, you know, how we see our life. At what point here, like, you know, maybe it starts here and we kind of, it just kind of goes up and we go, okay, well, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm at this stage here and then I went to this stage. I'll go, well, th this is the place right here where this, where this indicates, oh, I'm now at the second floor. Or what? No, not necessarily. So it's just, again, it's this idea that we start here and then we go up and we come back around. We come back around to the same spot. You're traveling up this staircase. You're going to come back around to the same spot. The difference is you're higher up than you were last time. You're further along in your spiritual walk with Jesus. And so this is the process. And so it's good for us to remember, every one of us, this is a process. How long is this process going to take? all your life forever, right? Like this is the process that we're in. There, so even when we get to the end of this series, and you know, because this series does have an end, even when we get to the end of the series and we get to that last stage, the interesting thing is, and you'll discover this once we get there, it just loops back around. It loops back around and it gets deeper and deeper and goes further up and further up. And so we kind of begin with that first real stage in our Christian journey. And so this is the image that Bill and Christy have given us in these stages real quick. Show it to me real quick. There it is. So this confidence in Christ right up here. This is this, is this early stage and this is where I was in my journey of faith. And so I'm super excited. I mean, I, I could not get enough of the word of God early on in my life. And this was the place where, you know what? I just, we just believe. We just believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And we put our faith in the one who lived and who died and who rose again. And the reality is as an early Christian, as a Christian in these early stages of faith, we act on what we, we, we believe on what we act on, right? And so, and so this is what we're doing. And so consequently, we choose to come to faith in Jesus Christ and we just trust Christ. We just choose to trust Christ. We're putting our confidence in him. We're growing in faith. We're excited about, about faith. And, and, and this is the place where what I discovered, and it took me a while to get there. Even though I had come to faith in Jesus at an early age, I didn't experience it until a number of years later. And that was then that, 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 that I started going to church and I began to see the church as a, as a family of faith. And I was, I, I was really intrigued and I noticed that, and this is why one of the symbols that you see you know, in this journey, if you're reading the book, it's the church. You discover the family of faith. You discover the people there and you discover, and, and you discover like I, I noticed in my own church when I was growing up, I was like, what is this, this Lent thing that they're talking about? And then they talk about Advent and, and then there's this other thing, Pentecost. And, and I was just like, this, this family of people held together by a common faith in, in Jesus, they do time differently than my family. They celebrate rhythms and cycles and seasons differently than the rest of the world. And I was intrigued and I was drawn into that. You know, th but this is this journey of, of our faith 
faith when, when this, the scripture, is super exciting. Not, not that it isn't in other phases, and it should be. It, it genuinely should be. But, but man, this is suddenly like you become aware that God speaks to his people, and there is a mechanism by which we can discern the will of God, know God, know what it is that God has for us. And you're like, man, I've got to dig in. And so you just you get connected to the word of God. It's also the place in the life of the church when you begin, you discover the sacraments you know, Holy Communion. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm coming to church and I'm worshiping and this is amazing. And, and here, and, and like three-fourths of the way through a worship service, I get a snack. Like they give me juice and crackers. This is amazing. What a great place, you know? It's like, well, not quite, Jeff. You know, <laughs> close, but no. No, it's symbolic and, and it has a meaning and it's a, it's a mechanism. It's a means and a way for us to connect with Almighty God, to remember what God has done in our life to remember the story that we're that we're being drawn into and it's also not just just it's not just remembrance alone but it, but it's also this place where fascinatingly he meets us he meets us at his table he meets us in the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the cup it's where we encounter the sacraments of baptism and so we're, we we come to baptism. This is why we put a baptismal font. By the way, look over there. Did you know? Did you know that's a baptismal font? That's not a trash can. I know, right? That really, it's a baptismal font, and there's water in there, which is why I encourage you, whenever you walk past it, if you've been a person who's been baptized, take your finger, dip it into the water, trace the sign of the cross on your forehead, and recognize and remember your baptism. Remember that God claimed you. It's this tangible way of experiencing this confidence of renewing our confidence in who God is and what God has done. So you think about baptism, you think, what is it, what, you know, what, what, what's it all represent? It represents these early stages in our journey of faith and later stages as well. What's it, what's it, what's it a symbol of? Forgiveness. It's washing, it's cleansing. It's this idea of spiritual regeneration, of new life and newness. And so again, this is why we put this right there. It's also this passage of scripture that we think is related to what Jesus says to John, in, or, or to Nicodemus rather, in John chapter three. He says, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can, only, can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. I can't encourage you enough that when you come to those days when we receive Holy Communion, when, 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 that, when you walk past each week that baptismal font, I would say, dip your finger in there. Uh, return again. Renew your own commitment. Renew your own confidence in Christ. This C stage, it's really the place where you are marveling over the grace of God. We sang about it a moment ago. Uh, Chris led us in that, that, that great song. We were like, I can't comprehend it. I'm never going to understand the grace of God. Have you ever just stopped to marvel and you're like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You mean to tell me that God is, God forgives me and like I can't sin away the grace of God? How's that work, right? Like you just, you're blown away. There are times in my own life when I would go back to the Lord and I would say, okay, I just don't understand how you can forgive me. I just don't understand your grace. And deep within my own spirit, I'll, it's almost as if I sense the Lord going, nor will you ever stop trying. Like you just, you can't, you can't plumb the depths of the love of God. You just can't. You can't get to the bottom. There's no way. It's deeper and more infinite than you ever would have known. It's that old hymn, how, how, how deep the Father's love for us. I mean, it's just, it's, it's vast. It's amazing. And also, I would simply say, one of the things that we do in this early C stage of our spiritual journey is we fall down a lot. Because, because we're stumbling. We're, we're trying to do what's right. We're trying to follow God and we're trying to live the, a, a right life or whatever. And so we're struggling. We're struggling with temptation and temptation is coming at us and it's difficult. And so we're stumbling. So we're falling down and we get up and we fall down and we get up and we fall down and we get up and we sin and we confess and we sin and we confess and we sin and we confess. And so we're receiving the forgiveness of God on a regular basis when we repent, when we turn away from it. And God is, God is so gracious and he's so kind to, to continue to forgive us. And he just kind of picks us back up and brushes us off and, we, and sends us on our way. And so what we develop, hopefully, is a strong hope 
and a confidence, literally, in Christ. And the, wor- and the word that I would use, I think, that, that helps to um, explain this, this stage in our life is the word expectation. Because what happens is, is we open the scripture and we're expectant that we're going to hear from God. We come to church and we're expectant that, that God's going to meet us. Maybe it's a prayer, maybe it's a song, maybe it's an encouragement, maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's in the sermon, maybe it's a scripture, maybe it's something. But, but we almost come with an expectation and a desire to hear what God has to say for us. Again, we'll go back to that passage I read it a minute ago from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says this, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with what? Great expectation. This is it. This is it. Now the thing about these kind of stages, and here's what you're going to discover, and you probably already have because you're smart and you're kind of further along. You're going to discover this. Um, You're going to want to get to the next stage. So there is this expectation and there's this desire. We just want to get from one phase to the next phase. It's kind of like parenting. Remember when your kids were little, and then maybe they still are, and your kids are in diapers, and you're like, can we just get out of the diaper phase, right? Just please, anything but the diapers. And then they move out of the diapers, and they kind of move, maybe they moved into like terrible twos, and and maybe the twos extended into the threes, and and then maybe the threes went even into the fours or whatever. And then, and then, so they're toddling and they're walking and then now they're in preschool and then they're in elementary school and it just kind of keeps going. And so as a parent, you're just kind of going, it's the next phase, it's the next phase, it's the next phase, it's the next phase. It's the next. And, and the phases always go. Here's the problem with that. Sometimes what we need to do is we just need to relish the phase and just know that, guess what? It's a phase. It's a phase. They're gonna grow out of it and they're gonna move on. Well, guess what? So are we. So are we, and it's just a phase, right? This is it. It's like parenting, and, and it's pregnancy. Ladies, remember? Remember what it was like when, when you were pregnant early on, and you were like, can we just get past the morning sickness? And then you're into the tr- second trimester, and then it's like, oh, yeah, and, the thir- and then by the third trimester, you're like, get it out. <laughs> just get this baby out, and you want to get into the next phase. And it's this, it's, again, it's the parenting pregnancy phase of life, and this is kind of the way it works. Here's the thing, as it relates to your spiritual development, And the journey that each and every one of us, and this is the good news today, right? Like the good news is every one of us is on this journey. You say, I don't believe in, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. Well, here's what I think. I think you're in a different whole, I think you're in a whole nother journey. You're in the journey where God is wooing you unto himself and, and pulling you into a relationship. And he's using everything in your life to draw you into this place where you will become a person who hopefully is a person of deep abiding faith in Jesus Christ. But it moves at the pace of the spirit of the living God. It just does. I think the kingdom of God moves at the speed of trust. And what I mean by that is is if we will trust God to do what God knows is in our best interest, it may not be the easiest thing, it may not be the nicest thing, we may not like it, but if we trust God to do what is in our best interest, I believe that God will use situations and circumstances and everything, and somehow or another in the sovereign almighty hand of God, he will weave it all together for good because what God is always after, and you can take this to the bank, this is as good as gold, God is always after maturity, and spiritual formation in your life. God wants you to be a deeply formed, mature person in Jesus Christ. In fact, here I'm going to give you a definition of what it is. Christian maturity is giving as much as you know of yourself to as much as you know of God. Take a picture of that. That's, that's worth keeping. So it doesn't matter how old you are. Sometimes we think of all these stages and things that come along in life. They come later, and maybe they do. And but you know what? Let's, I, just, I think every one of us, we have to understand at the outset, we're all in this journey of faith. So let's return to the anchor passage that really kind of holds this whole series together. And that's Psalm 23. We'll go back to verse 1. It says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I what? Need. Some, you ever sat there and you ever looked at something and said, You know what I need? And he's like, mm, Maybe you don't really need that. Maybe that's a want right? Like I'm notorious for this and I admit it. Like I'll sit there and I'll look at Gay and she could, she could, she could back, don't nod your head, babe. Um, you know, but she would just, she would, I would just, I would say, you know what I need? She would go, need? Okay, fine, want. And then at that point, I don't even feel like sharing it anymore because now it just sounds selfish, you know? And you're like, you know what? Never mind. I'm fine. I'm good. I don't, I don't need anything. 
you know, this is it. You know, so what we discover is we discover that in this early stage, when we have confidence in Jesus Christ, he's going to meet our needs because he's the great shepherd. He's going to meet our needs. Sometimes you get your wants, not all the time. Then you're spoiled, right? We know that from parenting, but, but God will meet your needs. And so, you know, we, we, we go into it knowing that God's going to meet our needs. And guess what? That is a statement of faith. When you say, God will meet my needs, that's a statement of faith. And as you grow, you begin to experience that. Now, one of the things that I really enjoy about their book is they also give you some, some obstacles or some road hazards, if you weigh, that you're going to discover along the way. Um, you know, it's like when you open up ways, but you open up ways too late after you pass the last exit before the next thing. And now you're in this long stretch and then there's this sea of taillights and you're like, oh man, and then it's only then that you realize you should have exited, you know, a half mile back and now you can't. And so I think there are some obstacles and some roadblocks on the journey of faith that you probably need to be aware of. And so one of those uh, is this, this early on in our, in our spiritual life, we're going to experience this, this idea of, of growing in confidence with Jesus. But, but they call it what the language that they use in this is called a soul split. And what it basically indicates is um, there's this idea of, hey, we want to be faithful to God, but when real struggle and temptation comes our way, we give in and, you know, we stumble and fall. So that's why I said there's a whole lot of standing up and falling down and standing up and falling down. Think about Peter. Peter is in this kind of early stage as well when Peter says this. He says, and this is at the night when Jesus was being betrayed, he says, all of you guys are going to desert me. And Peter goes, hey, 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 all these other knuckleheads may leave. He says, but not me. He says, I'll follow you even if I have to die. And, and Jesus looks at him in his best Southern way. Jesus goes, bless your heart, you know, Peter. Um, before the rooster crows three times, you will, you're going to deny me, okay? And so what that point, what's that point to? It points to we're really willing and, and we want to be faithful and we want to serve God and we want to do what's right. But when the going gets tough, man, sometimes we just don't stand up well because, you know, maybe our roots aren't down deep or, or whatever it is. And, or maybe we're just still a little fleshly and we give in to the temptation. And so we fall away rather quickly. We've all experienced this. So here, here's an example. Allow me to be the poster child for just how not to do this, okay, for a moment. I remember early on, I'm so on fire. I'm so in for God. I was, I said this to God. This is dumb, okay? Just, I'm gonna share it. I told God, <laughs> oh, this is funny. I told God, I said, God, I am so committed to you. Go ahead, tempt me. You'll, you'll see how, how loyal I am. You're dumb, Jeff. You're just... <laughs> You're just dumb. Don't, don't, don't ask God to tempt, right? Like now God, tempt, I know temptation doesn't come from the Lord. I, I get all that. But what, what am, I just feel like I'm inviting trouble in this moment. And so there were the, these, all these temptations and struggles that just sort of seemed to come my way. And what I discovered was I wasn't really as, as rooted as I thought I was in that space. But again, this is where what I think we need to do as Christian people, we need to learn the reality of spiritual warfare. We need to realize that we were born into a world at war, that we have an enemy. I'm not your enemy. You have one. You have one. He has a plan. It's not a good one. God has a plan. It is a good one. You need to learn the truth of spiritual warfare. You need to learn how to take captive those thoughts. You, you need to grow in, in your understanding of the word of the living God. You need to know how to stand and fight in the name of Jesus. And so this is it. So these are some of the struggles that we have as we're walking through this, this journey of faith. The second stage that we walk into after this kind of confidence in Christ stage is this H stage, this help and discipleship phase. And so you're, you're, again, you're still excited. You're growing in your faith. And now what happens is if you're not careful, you're going to be open to maybe some spiritual gullibility. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and you remember this from our Unleashing Hope series. He writes to them and he says this, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Do you remember that? We talked about spiritual gifts. I said, take the spiritual gifts assessment. We're going to have a serve fair. I want you to be able to use your gifts in ministry, that kind of thing. So what Paul's basically saying to the church in Corinth is, guess what? You can be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Paul says, don't want you to be that way. So don't be spiritually ignorant or gullible, okay? I like what Bill says in his book. He writes this about the H stage. He says, in the H stage of our faith, again, Think spiral staircase. Always think spiral staircase. We're prone to be strong, but stupid. We have zeal without knowledge. Hey, 
<laughs> this was me. This was me early in my journey of faith. I was so, I was so on fire. I was so sold out. I couldn't get enough Jesus. I couldn't get enough Bible. I couldn't get enough church. I couldn't get enough worship. I was just hungry for God. I would witness to just about anybody. Like it was, it was so strong. I just, I was like, a moment of confession. I was, just, I was like skipping class to like go do other things. And so I wound up making a couple of D's in, in a course. But I was like, I told, tried to convince my parents. I was like, it's no big deal. Jesus is going to come back soon anyway. And like, you know, math's not really that important, you know. Uh, but, but, but knowing God is, you know, <laughs> my dad didn't buy that either. Um, but but this is this is kind of where we can we can kind of sit in this, and so you have to be careful. This isn't just the acquisition of Bible information. Remember what Paul also writes. Paul also says this. He says knowledge puffs up, and so just the acquisition of Bible information will make you more arrogant than than other individuals, you know, or than you should be. And so because we think we're better than people, but we're really not. So let's go back to that anchor passage in Psalm twenty three. Here's what Paul, or rather the psalmist, writes. Psalm 23, verse 2, He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Now, what, what's really important around this H stage and, I, and, and this is, is um, you don't go it alone. In fact, notice who's involved in this passage. He lets me, right? He leads me. Who is it? It's the psalmist and, and the shepherd. So there's sheep and shepherd here. There's, there's, there's God in you and there's God in me. The, it's, it's us with the Lord. And so these, these are who the characters are. This is key in this stage. And the reason I say this is, here's, listen to me. You need to be with people who are smarter than you, wiser than you, more, more, more mature than you, further down the road than you. You don't need to be around people who necessarily are only smarter than you. Maybe like they've got more Bible trivia. We're not, we're not talking about Bible trivia. We're talking about wisdom. And wisdom is just simply applied knowledge. It's you've got enough life under your belt that you now can guide someone in the way everlasting. You can guide someone to know Jesus more. This is, this, these are the people that you want to be with. You need to be around people who have integrated their feelings into their thinking. This is why it's so important for you to be around, for all of us to be around, help, listen to me, healthy, emotional, uh, and spiritual people. You need to be around healthy, emotional, spiritual people. Okay, because when you are, th then they're going to guide you in the right way. In fact, this kind of backs up this idea of what Paul writes to Timothy. He says this. He says, you've heard me teach truth. You've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. And so you need, as you already well know, you need people in your life. You need people who are smarter than you, wiser than you, deeper than you who can mentor you, guide you, coach you through, and, and they wind up ultimately making a difference in your life. This was what David was to me early on in my journey of faith, me and, and these three or four other dudes that we just kind of got together and hung out with. So you need different types of people in your life. Again, I, I go back to the series that we preached back in the beginning of the year, Unleashing Hope. I mentioned there are three types of people that you need to have in your life. Let's expand on that and return to that very, that very same idea. You need a Paul. Your Paul is your teacher. This is the person who's going to pour into you. They're the one who you're going, to, you're going to ask questions of and who's going to guide you. This is the person who's going to listen to you. They're going to be the person who's non-judgmental toward you. They're going to encourage the questions that you bring. And there's no question that's too dumb that you can't bring to this person. And, and, and they're not going to ever look at you and go, come on, don't be dumb. No, no, they're just going to receive. They're going to receive because then they're going to pour back into you. This is the individual who's further down the road spiritually than yourself. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a Paul? Who is that person in your life? And then the second person you're going to need is a Barnabas. We mentioned this earlier as well. Barnabas is your encourager. They're your cheerleader. This is the person who's going to say, hey, hey, listen, it's not as bad as you think it is. There's the person who's going to talk you off the ledge. They're going to say, no, 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 don't jump. You know, they're, they're the individual who's going to pick you up and dust you off and say, you know what? We believe in you. You can't quit now. You can do this. You, you, you're, you're going to make this. You're going to get past this. So who's your Barnabas? Who's this individual who encourages you in your life? And then lastly, this third person is probably the little harder one, and that's Timothy. Timothy's the learner. And I would think that most of us probably might have a hard time putting our finger on who the Timothy is in our life. 
But this is what you need. You need to have somebody that you're pouring into. It could be your kids. It could be somebody else. It could be someone at school. It could be your workplace or, you know, it could be somebody else in your family. I don't know. It could be a neighbor, whomever it is. But you've got to have somebody that you are pouring back into and someone who's learning from you. So, so again, I ask the question, who's the Timothy? Now, there, again, here's a, every, every one of these phases or stages, call them whatever you want to, it really doesn't matter. They have their own roadblock. They have their own hazard. Here's a hazard in the H stage, and that's misinterpreting Scripture. If you're not careful, you're going to wind up misinterpreting the Bible because you'll just be so hungry and so excited. You're going to come to the Scriptures. You're going to be like, this thing is amazing. Did you know it says this? Did you know we can ask this and we can say that and this kind of thing? And that stuff's good, and it's really super exciting. But then you're going to come to those portions of the Bible that won't make any sense to you. And if you're not careful, you're going to misinterpret. For example, you, uh, that passage of Scripture when you read in Matthew that Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. First time I read that, I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that I'm, I'm supposed to be perfect? Like how in the world am I supposed to be perfect? Well, again, if you understand and you kind of dig and you got somebody to teach you, what you quickly discover is perfect doesn't necessarily mean sinless. What perfect means in the original language is it means complete or mature. Oh, okay, wait a minute, hold up. So now what that means is be mature like your heavenly father is mature. Be complete like your heavenly father is complete. Okay, now that's something I can shoot for. Now that's something I might be able to attain. Perfection? No, not, not, not the way that I understand it. Or that passage of scripture that Jesus says, um, hey, unless you hate your mother and father, you know, you have no part of me or whatever. You're like, okay, whoa, time. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't always like mom and dad, you know, and like sometimes they, they irritate me. But I'm not so sure that, that hating them is the right thing. That, that kind of feels, well, wait a minute. Once you understand what Jesus is really talking about, and you understand that's a figure of speech, it's called hyperbole, which is used for exaggerational purposes. It's like saying, oh, daylight savings time has me so tired I could go sleep a month. Mm, probably not going to sleep a month. You might take a nap but you're not going to sleep a month. When you understand these kind of things, you won't misinterpret the Scripture. I fell into this, I'll be honest with you. Early on, I listen, early on, I was so excited and I was so Bible hungry. Do you know what I discovered? I discovered that there are preachers on TV that will teach this. Uh, not every preacher that's on TV who opens this is really solid and really good. And so consequently, what happened early on in my faith journey was I kind of slid into a little bit of what we now call prosperity theology gospel, which there was this idea of, well, it's just name it, claim it. And the Bible says you got this and you got that. Well, then you got that and you got that. And I'm just going to claim it. That, that didn't work out real well. Okay, the, the only way that I, uh, I later began to discover this was I began to get around people who were wiser than me, smarter than me, deeper than me, and they slowly began to correct that and de help me deconstruct that. And then they taught me back in another direction. Okay, this is, this is what we need to be doing. This is, th th these are the people in our life. My very first pastor, very first pastor that I ever had, a gentleman by the name of Harold Buck. Now, I loved Reverend Buck. He pastored Red Bank United Methodist Church. He was a super neat guy. Can't remember any of his sermons whatsoever, you know? I know, right? Like, how disappointing. Here, but here's what I do remember. I remember when he preached, he would, he would oftentimes weep because he would become so overwhelmed with emotion. And the reason that impacted me was because I was like, man, this guy believes what he's talking about. You know, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's amazing. I personally don't have the gift of tears often that much, especially in like public settings. So, you know, I've often had to wrestle with like, you know, I really believe that. Yes, I do. I don't have to be like that. But I would oftentimes go up to him after service and he would see me coming. And I know he thought, oh Lord, here it comes. And I would walk up to him and I would just pepper him with questions. Reverend Buck, can I ask you a question? Yeah, Jeff, what you got this week? And it was literally, that was it. And so I would just ask him question after question after question. When the Bible says this, why does it say that? And why this is this? And why is that? And this kind of thing. And he would bless his heart. He'd do his best to answer. And there were sometimes he would go, I don't know. That's a great question. Let me see if I can find an answer for you. And he'd come back to me the next week and say, okay, I did a little digging. Here's what I found. And so he, I just knew that there was this individual that I could turn to. Let me, let me say something to you. I think there's a lot of you in this room. You can be that person. I think there's a lot of potential Pauls and Barnabases and yes, even Timothys in this room because regardless of where you are on the journey of faith, I don't need you to see it as a linear journey. I need you to see it as a spiral staircase. 
We're just going to keep circling. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep growing higher and higher and deeper and deeper and farther and farther in the Lord. But what I want you to do over this next couple of weeks, or just maybe this next week before, between now and this next, this next uh, stage in our journey, I want you to pray and I want you to ask God about who you can be a Paul to. I want you to pray. And if you don't have a Barnabas, I want you to ask God to give you a Barnabas. It might take a while. It might take a while. I'm praying for a Paul, and I've been praying for a, a certain type of Paul in my life, and I've been praying for about a year and a half now, and I'm going to keep praying. So you just keep praying for a Paul. You, you pray that you can become Paul. You pray that God will send you a Barnabas or that you can be a Barnabas, and you know what? You might even pray that God sends you a Timothy. And if you know you're Timothy, then you might need to pour more in to him or her because here's, the, here's what I know. Listen to me. And I'm going to go back to what, 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 what Peter said in First Peter. It's those first few words. Ready? You are not forgotten. You are not forgotten. Our Father knows you. He knows your name. He knows where you are on the spiritual journey. Our God has given us ways and means to meet with Him. Here's one. Here's one. So, what do you say? Shall we meet with God?